So we were going to go ahead and get started, and I was going to go ahead and just kick things off, but maybe first we can just do some introductions around the room. Maya, do you want to start us off? Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Maya. I'm a worker owner at Soto Cooperative. Good morning. I'm Rebecca Emanuel, and um, I'm looking at Imagine Boston 2030, which is the long-term vision for the city of Boston. Dan. Uh, Dan Atkinson with the Hey, Cole Rosenberg, where's that? I'm Alex Papali, I'm with Clean Water Action, and I help to coordinate the, uh, the Boston Recycling Coalition, which is, we were going to announce today, is, which is changing our name to Zero Waste Boston. Congratulations. <laughs> uh, and I'm Chris Osgood, I serve as Mayor Walsh's Chief of Streets, Transportation, and Sanitation. Nicole? Nicole Caravella, Mayor Walsh's Press Secretary. Uh, Lorraine Manuela, Director of Communications and Community Environment, and Mayor Walsh's Rob DeRosa, Public Works. Susan Casino, the Environment Department. Uh, Jenny Gazzano from Youth on Board. Edward Tavia from Youth on Board. Uh, Carl Spector, Commissioner of the Environment. Nina Fayola from Alternative Community and Environment. Claire Miller from Toxics Action Center. Tali Graham from Mascosh, the Coalition for Occupational Safety and Health. Great. Well, first and foremost, thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. I'm Austin Blackman. I'm the Chief of Environment, Energy, and Open Space, and it's my honor and privilege to lead the Environment Department, Parks and Recreation, as well as Inspectional Services for Mayor Walsh. Uh, we've already gone around the table to introduce some of the great stakeholders that we have for today's media roundtable and the, the community partners that we have in, in helping us push this mo movement forward. I'm especially pleased to be joined with Rebecca Emanuel, our director of Imagine Boston 2030, our city-wide master plan, as well as Chief Osgood, uh, my, my partner in crime, who leads over uh, Department of Public Works, as well as the Department of Transportation, and uh, helps us uh, in terms of implementing our what will be our zero waste plan. Uh, from a personal perspective, I'm really, really passionate uh, about this work because I'm an only child, and so growing up, I had lots and lots of chores, and my very, <laughs> my very least favorite of those chores was taking out the trash. Um, and so reducing waste is something I'm certainly interested in doing. Um, and also, as a, in my early career uh, as a consultant, I was trained on uh, waste and processes and financials, and so very, very uh, happy and excited to be working on waste reduction for the city of Boston as well. Um, we, we have to do waste production in a really, really smart way. And that's why we are kicking off this process to do a holistic analysis, including a cost-benefit analysis and how the city of Boston can move forward. We think it's also incredibly important that we get input from, our community, from the community. That's why we are very, very pleased to be working with Zero Waste Boston uh, <laughs> and uh, partners from our community haulers as well at Cerro to make sure that we continue to get the input on those processes as we do this evaluation. Some of the guiding principles for us are things that really, really come directly from the mayor. Uh, just a few weeks ago, Mayor Walsh passed uh, or recommended a $3.1 billion budget. Uh, he continually reminds us that if we were in the private sector, we would be a Fortune 1000 company. We would use data on a daily basis to drive our decision making. And we should absolutely do that as the city of Boston. There's no reason why we otherwise shouldn't. Uh, and so our zero waste plan will follow in the footsteps of Go Boston 2030, which Chief Osgood had the pleasure of leading, that Imagine Boston 2030, another data-driven approach that Rebecca led, that Climate Ready Boston, that Commissioner Carl Spector had the privilege of leading to ensure that as we come up with our recommendations and strategies and implement them, that they're coming from a data-driven perspective. And uh, from there, you know, I think that we'll go ahead and kick off a broader conversation around the principles as well as why we think zero waste planning is important for the city of Boston. And uh, we'll do that until we're joined by the mayor and he'll give a couple of remarks and then we can just kind of continue the conversation. So I'd love to actually first hand off to our colleagues at Zero Waste Boston and have them give us their perspective in terms of why zero waste planning is important for the city of Boston. Right, yeah. 
Well, I just want to begin with some thanks. Uh, you know, of course, uh, Mayor Walsh, I'll save that for when he's in the room, but, um, um, but you know, Austin, uh, we would really want to thank you, Commission, uh, Chief Blackman, for, uh, uh, you know, you, you, you were uh, receptive to our, our, our asks early on, even before you came on board. I remember talking to you while you were just on the West Coast, I think, and uh, uh, you committed to, you know, taking a serious look at at, um, at zero waste in Boston, and, and you were you were serious about that commitment, so I really appreciate that. And also, just in particular, Susan Casino, um, director of recycling, just want to thank you, Susan, for engaging with us over, over the years and being a strong advocate for zero waste inside inside City Hall. And um, you know, you, you've really played a key role in bridging some, some of the divide between the, uh, the operations side and the policy side. So thank you for that, and, and Rob as well. You know, for um, you know, helping us to get to the moment we're in now. So, um, you know, it's, it, sh it should be pretty clear that today's announcement is, is a culmination of years of work, and uh, this is a true city-community partnership. Um, we're really looking, you know, this is a great first step. We're looking forward to how this plays out and, and, and working with you all, um, with, with the city and with other partners around, the, uh, around, you know, around town to, uh, um, to, to build a world-class uh, zero-waste program in, in Boston. Um, so, yeah, it's just, you know, hoping. Great. Maya, anything that you'd want to add to that? Yeah, I, I definitely think um, Seto is a collaborator with Zero Waste Boston and actually um, came out of that effort in thinking about in what way can we um, increase diversion, waste diversion in Boston, and also um, think about how to increase the quality of life for the for the, on the planet um, and for our residents. And I think that's why zero waste planning is a priority for Boston. Because a lot of times we're thinking about how can we improve um, how people are living in our city. And you know, when CERO was created um, through the efforts of MASHKOSH and Boston Workers Alliance and, and Zero Waste Boston, um, a lot of people were granted a job when they had been looking for years. A lot of people were able to have savings for the first time. And we were able to divert over two million pounds of organic waste from our inception in 2014. So I think that's, that's an achievement that kind of couldn't have been done without zero waste thinking. And I think that you know, bringing that to a larger stage in Boston is something that more residents can um, reap the benefits of. Chief? Um, so in the definition of zero waste, also in the aspiration is sort of about things that are ethical, efficient, economic, and visionary, which I sort of love those four. And I feel like Maya just touched on some of the things which are the more aspirational side. And I was going to talk about one of the more mundane components, which is the economic piece. So the city of Boston spends, and Rob, correct me where I go straight here, roughly $37 million in sort of waste hauling and disposal contracts in the city of Boston. Um, about 20 plus, $22 million of that is for actual pickup of the recyclables, pickup of trash at the curbside. That remaining bit is the cost for actually disposing trash um, or uh, getting money right now from recycling. So for every ton of trash that we are uh, dropping off, uh, we are paying $65 a ton. Um, for every ton of recycling that we drop off, we are actually paid $2 a ton. Rob, I go to stress. So, uh, I mean, that is, uh, there is a, a very clear uh, financial benefit to every uh, taxpayer in the city of Boston, every uh, person in the city of Boston for uh, finding ways that we can actually uh, increase our diversion rate, whether that's by reducing the amount of trash that are sort of solid waste, whether it's recycled or, uh, or trash that we're putting on the curb, um, or by shifting more of that to actually recycling. And because of, to echo Alex's comments, to, to, you know, we have made good progress over the last eight years because of the hard work of Rob and of Susan, uh, increasing our, uh, our diversion rate. And I think what this moment is, is not just the culmination of a lot of hard work in years past, but um, helping us to figure out what are the next steps that we can take as a city to, uh, to deliver on something which is really going to benefit uh, every person in Boston. I'll just place this in a broader perspective of, sort of what kind of city we want to live in. And so the mayor asked the residents of Boston, what kind of city do we want to have in 2030? And what are the action steps that we need to get there? And shaped by over 14,000 different resident voices, um, Imagine Boston sort of lays out the priorities of the city. And among them are 
economic development and particularly inclusive economic development, promoting a healthy environment, combating climate change, and improving the quality of life for all of Boston's residents. And one of the remarkable things in my job is that occasionally there are things that if you do them, you can actually hit at a huge number of the goals that our residents laid out. So it's the kind of thing where you say, oh wait, wait, this one thing helps here, here, and here. And zero waste is one of those things. So let me just lay out for you why this is so exciting for the future of the city of Boston. So by doing zero waste planning, not only do we, and here I want you to count with me for a moment, okay? So we continue Boston's legacy as a leader in reducing greenhouse gases. That's one. We also create green jobs, which is something that Maya was talking about here. And green jobs, interestingly, that are not displaceable, right? You can't outsource them to another country, another part of the country. They're actually Boston jobs intrinsically. And they're also jobs that are accessible to people at a wide range of sort of um, educational levels. And that, for us, is one of the things that we think a lot about when we think about the future of the city of Boston. It also avoids creating new pollutants, such as in our water streams and our air. And that's one of the priorities that we've heard over and over again from our residents overall. It also creates just a better daily quality of life for our residents, something that often kicked us off with, whether it's for kids or for adults <laughs> or for choice. people walking our sidewalks, <laughs> frankly. And then that one of the things that we know deeply and that has kicked off part of the Imagine Boston planning process is that our population is growing. More and more people and more and more businesses want to call Boston home. In order to address what it takes to lay the groundwork for the kind of population boom that we're having, frankly, we're going back up to probably meet or possibly exceed our peak population this century, we have to do this. Our model currently is not scalable, but if we can address this right now, we can actually get ready for the kind of boom that we're anticipating. So five goals, I hope you're counting all of them. Um, one action that moves us toward all five. And I'm sort of inspired by the voices of our residents. So one of our residents told us, listen, there's so much quality stuff bound up in our landfills. And we're actually paying to bind it up in our landfills, but we would get paid and be able to have more resources if we, if we implemented this from the beginning. And that also pays more of our residents better with these green jobs. So as we look to the future of our growing city, we know that zero waste planning will help us create the kind of city that our residents envision for us and also create green, non-displaceable jobs and address our climate-related risks, which helps in a lot of our long-term visions as to what it will take to make sure that our city continues to be thriving and growing. So I'm excited to manage to check off five different <laughs> goals with one particular set of actions, and today feels like a pretty major step. Maybe we can talk a little bit more about how we got here. And you know, Alex, the then Boston Recycling Coalition, now Zero Waste Boston, was really instrumental and bringing together a group of stakeholders to inform some of the principles that are going to be part of this plan. Do you want to maybe tell us a little bit about that process? Sure, yeah. You know, it was clear from the beginning, <clears throat> excuse me, it was clear from the beginning of this campaign that this is not just an environmental issue. When people think about recycling, typically it's seen as a, you know, as something, it's a green uh, initiative and uh, we should do it for the sake of the environment. That's obviously very important. You know, we're, we're, we have a major climate effort in Boston and so on. Um, and, and, you know, the, the toxic pollution from uh, disposal affects, uh, you know, uh, vulnerable communities, economically disadvantaged communities, uh, and communities of color disproportionately. So there, there are good reasons to, to uh, think about the environmental side of this. But um, it's very important to also include, uh, you know, worker safety and health and, uh, you know, fair wages and that kind of thing. Um, and, and the benefits, the, the impact on communities locally. So our, our partners in the coalition reflect those 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 concerns and those values um, and uh, you know the, the folks who introduced themselves around the room and others who are not here today as well uh, were really instrumental in uh, framing the conversation for, for, the, for us and you know how we approach the city on this. Um, we're talking about changes that uh, you know will, will affect every household in the city of Austin uh, and potentially every business um, so it's very important that we do this carefully and 
in a, in a, in a, have a thorough, um, you know, very well uh, thought through engagement process, community engagement process, and, and make sure that everyone's got a voice in this, in this plan that, that comes out. Um, so, you know, we've raised funding from Bar Foundation and Boston Foundation and others to help us do this, this planning process uh, to work with the city to, uh, to you know, to mobilize uh, our, our communities. And, um, you know, this is a, 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 it's an opportunity for us to, to really go, go for the gold here. We, we got to, you know, there's a lot that's already been done. Uh, it's a good foundation, but we have a, a lot of room to grow. In 2014, we set targets of um, 50 percent waste diversion by 2020, 75 uh, percent by 2030, and zero waste by 2040. Zero waste is typically defined as 90 percent plus, but um, we're a couple years behind. But you know, we still think those those goals are within reach. So um, there's you know, we're just looking forward to getting all the voices into this conversation. And obviously, the, the principles you know, that are up on the screen, but we should probably talk about them just in detail, to make zero waste a priority, to focus on wasting less first and diverting more, to make sure that we're supporting this work through local business and then sustaining the work through a, a culture change. And what we're going to do with, and what we're announcing today, is we're releasing a request for proposals for a zero waste plan. And we want to bring on a consultant who's going to help us evaluate what those tasks were. And some of the major tasks within that RFP will be for this consultant really to dive into the data, as I mentioned before, to really help us understand where some of the existing policies and future investments could be to help us get to that zero waste, what a, an effective series of goals would look like from a cost benefit, per, benefit perspective, what are the most efficient ways for us to get there, uh, and then also to present these zero waste plan recommendations to the city as what we might be able to do from a policy perspective, how we might be able to leverage our hauling contract. Maybe Chief Oscar, do you, do you want to maybe expand on that a little bit? Sure. I mean, I, I think that we have seen sort of a series of uh, innovations, which largely other people in the room can take credit for, um, but, <laughs> but I'll quickly speak to them, um, from uh, helping the city go to single stream to sort of finding the uh, so changing the balance between recycling days and trash days, um, increasing the amount of yard waste pickup that we see in the city of Boston now to 15 weeks over the course of the year, including uh, next week having things like household hazardous waste days, textile drop-off days, e-waste days, paper shredding days, um, three of which are going to be taking place tomorrow at, at Front of Road. All of those things are sort of some of the very specific things that we have been able to do in part because of the, the previous analysis that's been done, the previous organization that's been done. Um, and I think what we are going to have an opportunity to do here, exactly as Austin was saying, is all right, what are the things that are going to have a high impact at some of the, um, on the aspirational goals that we, are, uh, that we have set out, um, but can be done in a way that is operationally feasible given our budget and given the, uh, the rules we have in place. And so we're really excited to uh, work with community partners and work with um, whoever is selected through this RFP process to really help us dive into that data, look at great practices from other municipalities, uh, and figure out what the next uh, key steps are, whether it's on the sort of commercial, institutional, industrial side or on the residential side for um, meeting the four objectives that Austin just walked through. Maya, Alex, from the convening that we brought together, were there anything, any things from other cities that you found particularly exciting that you'd want to talk about? Um, we, yeah, we've, we've been researching best practices in other cities for, for some time, and uh, uh, there are some, some, you know, some key learnings that we think are directly applicable here. Uh, for one thing, you know, as I said, this is potentially going to affect every household in the city and every business. And uh, in order to be successful, we're going to require broad participation. So a robust and, you know, multifaceted uh, engagement effort is going to be crucial here. Um, another thing is, is recognizing that youth play a key role. Um, they, they're ambassadors in their communities and in their homes. And, uh, you know, they're, they're often the first uh, folks in, in households to, to change behavior and, uh, and, and, you know, evangelize about the benefits of, of um, ways and, you know, and the, the necessity and so on. So these are, this is a, making sure that young folks have a, a voice in this process is going to be really key. Um, and then, you know, workers in the sector have to be treated fairly. Um, 
we're we're fortunate in Boston that to, to have a mayor who comes from a labor background and you know he's going to stand up for recycling workers and and uh, you know we're really uh, looking forward to seeing how he engages in this process. But uh, that's the, you know the city of Austin, for example, um, their city council. We heard a story about how they 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 were faced with the choice of saving some money by doing an end run around around workers or paying more and and um, treating them fairly. And they, they I mean it was like a no brainer for them. They they just it was so clear that this is what the city want their, the city's values um, demanded. And um, so you know we're hoping that that is going to be uh, part of the conversation in Boston as well. Um, and then the. Um, Another lesson from from Austin's you know fairly recent planning process was that they came up with this draft plan a pretty extensive plan, and then the community didn't like it and they had to scrap the whole thing and you know come up with something new that was that reflected what what people wanted. So it, it's an important lesson to to recognize that uh, uh, you know the city would be wise to um, to to zealously implement the the vision that comes through comes out from this planning process, um, that, that you know folks have a clear idea of what they want and um, you know and, and that should be the the basis for uh, a future plan. Um, those are some of the learnings that we got from other from other cities. Yeah, we were particularly excited to work with the community, but I think some of the learnings that we pulled away from other cities and the approaches that they had were just being really impressed with some of the ways that they leverage technology or, or even just completely different methods of dealing with uh, hauling. Uh, you know, so for instance, Los Angeles moving to a franchise system, uh, splitting the whole city into 11, 11 different zones. You've now got New York that's got a very, very ambitious goal of being zero waste to landfill by 2030 and implementing curbside single stream. Um, and San Francisco, where obviously they've made amazing progress, they're already diverting 80% of their waste uh, from landfill and uh, using three different types of bins and finding their landlords if they don't provide those to their residents. So all those different approaches, I think, were really interesting for us to see and learn from, and it will be good for us moving forward. But Rebecca, maybe you can talk to us in a little bit more detail in terms of how you see the zero waste plan and how it impacts land use planning and some of the work that you do with uh, Mad in Boston 2030. Sure, so there's a whole range of different goals that we're setting out um, over the long term and those um, are at this really interesting nexus point of how we think about who our city is in terms of the people make it up, the regular habits and practices that we have and how we think about our land and our resources going forward. And I think a lot of this is about unlocking more opportunity for our people um, and making sure that the resources that we already have we're using well and can actually turn into additional um, resources as we look toward the future. One of the other things that we realized when we talked with other um, municipalities, whether it was San Francisco or elsewhere across the country, was that one of the things that was interesting is that diving into their zero waste planning processes, they actually uncovered other savings and other um, sort of moments of operational excellence that were potential that they hadn't figured out before. And so by, this is something that you find in a lot of Fortune 100 and Fortune 500 companies is that when you look at what is wasted, you can actually uncover lots of operational opportunities and lots of savings, big picture. So in many ways, this is a learning that we have um, that we're very excited to look at internally and that we think can actually um, unlock a bunch of opportunity for, for our residents and for our population. Thank you for that. I mean, uh, my, you mentioned uh, City Soil before we, before we kicked off. And I think there's an interesting sort of set of current examples around places where we are um, thinking of something that was perhaps once thought of as waste and finding a way in which is a resource for communities. So in 2016, we collected around 8,300 tons of yard waste, leaf clippings, branches, et cetera. Um, and then through a partnership, we're able to convert about, uh, about 1,600 tons of uh, compost for community gardens in the city of Boston, which is a, a great way in which we're thinking about how you take something that used to potentially be in the waste stream and instead uh, helping it to support something which our residents really want to be able to do uh, by investing in uh, uh, vegetable gardens or uh, 
-hmm. small flower pots. And one of the really things that I'll say is that as Imagine Boston has heard from so, so many residents, um, sort of gardens, yeah, exactly. greening our city, and knowing sort of that they're part of that process yes. is huge, and seeing the opportunities here to be part of that in a tangible way. Yeah. One of the things that was very striking to me um, was that actually some of our older generation is leading the charge on recycling um, organics and compostables. Many, many people had this as part of their upbringing. It was a regular part of their practice. And so both um, our young and our old are often some of our most excited um, folks for this who, who really have it in their daily routines and in doing so are sharing it with their families and their communities. And that's one of the things that I really enjoy hearing the voices of our residents helping drive our policy, and it's one of the things that the mayor is very focused on, is sort of um, of the people, by the people, for the people policy, um, and this is a great example of that. I think um, looking at the zero waste planning campaigns of other cities, it's, it's evident that education and marketing is also a mm -hmm. large aspect of it, and thinking about um, getting the word out to residents to let them know why it's important and why they can participate and how, as you're saying. Um, and also just creates a value added aspect um, towards people's everyday lives when they understand what they're doing is a, a larger global effort. Great. Any comments that anyone wants to make to close before we open up to questions from the press? Just a minor plug. <laughs> Again, frontage road tomorrow, 9 a.m. to 2 p.m.? 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, if folks have household hazardous waste, if they've got textiles, if they've got uh, e-waste, things like that old VCR that's sitting in the corner of a, of a room that they want to be able to drop off, please come to Frontage Road, please drop it off. Uh, it is one of several uh, household hazardous waste, e-waste, textile uh, days that we have in the city of Boston. Folks can go to uh, boston.gov slash public works and get all the details, um, but it's uh, just one more way in which we can kind of engage uh, engage the community in helping them do the things that they want to be able to do. It's also an app on your phone, right? It's also an app on your phone, the Trash Day app, which you can download. We have over 10,000, I'm not sure the current 16. Time. 16 today, 16,000 yeah, users of the Trash Day app. Uh, I have to say it's uh, brilliant. Yes. <laughs> the resident of Alston. <laughs> <laughs> it gives you notifications. If you haven't downloaded, it gives you notifications for when your recycling days are. Trash days are, it helps you understand what are the things that could be recycled and what are the things that are currently um, uh, trash and also gives you notification of household waste days and things like that. Nicole, I'll hand it over to you. Okay. Um, Cole and Dan, do you guys have any questions for the group? Um, so the RFP that is coming out, that's going to hire a consultant. The consultant's going to work with the people here to come up with a zero waste plan. Uh, how long is that going to take? Uh, we're expecting that to take about nine months, um, but we will see based on uh, the feedback that we get through the proposals that come in. And do you know how much that roughly is expected to cost? Uh, $150,000. So zero waste by 2040 has been a goal for a couple of years now. Why now hire a consultant to get us there? Well, it's also more about identifying the ways that we get to zero waste and identifying the strategies that we can implement and as Chief Osgood was mentioning, how we can leverage our existing policies, our um, hauling contract that's gonna be coming up for bid and making sure that we take the time now to think through in a comprehensive way everything that we can do to get us towards those goals. So if, if the hauling contract is one of the sort of time sensitive things, the mayor's also kicked off planning across the city and one of the things that Imagine Boston does is it lays out our big goals, our key tactical actions for how to get there, and then very frequently, once we see what that action is, we say, great, how do we accomplish this quite bold goal that we've set? What are the key levers that we can do? And so you'll see that planning kicking off in a wide range of areas, so this is a great representation of that. If we're setting sort of stakes in the ground, then it's a question of how do we do it? When is the hauling contract done? Uh, it will be rebid in 2018 for start 2019. Who currently holds that? Uh, there are two companies, Sunrise and Capital. Well, we're on contracts. We get your sales up in 2019, correct? What about um, your waste energy contracts? Are those, are there any dates coming up? For those? Those are the waste, waste energy, yeah. 2019. 
2019. Uh, there's a lot of talk of creating jobs. How does that fit into, I guess, the hauling and other jobs you're looking to create here? I think here is a really great example of this. One of the things that we've been very excited about is, um, you know, and this is something that comes up, you know, from the mayor's office, is really excited about worker cooperatives. And there is a, you know, one of our worker cooperatives that we get to work with a bunch. And Mai's at the table here as a worker owner. Um, and so we're very excited to think about how more models um, on this kind of thing can both create jobs and, and make sure that um, that sort of is creating wealth for our residents. Yeah, I think a great example is uh, Seto just got the green light last week that we're able to um, partner with City Soil to deliver the soil um, to urban agricultural hotspots around the city. Um, that's touching on the point you mentioned earlier where um, more of the what we're viewing as waste, um, more that we can get out of the landfills and really see them as reusable resources um, that can create more jobs and create more resources for our city. So I think um, that's really exciting and it's something that, you know, as a Boston resident my whole life, it's great that I'm able to come back and be in my neighborhood and participate from this uh, in the reuse economy um, by taking what was food waste and now it's soil um, and providing that to people who want to grow their own food in our communities. It's really great. So are these city jobs, cooperative jobs, both? How is the city, what's the city's role in funding these? Yeah, I would say that it's probably across multiple sectors, not even necessarily just city jobs in particular, but you can imagine the different business opportunities that are created with this. Uh, as LA went to their franchise system, they're projecting an increase of about 2,000 jobs from that system. Uh, and that's both from the associated industries, whether it's creating more fertilizers, more opportunities for agriculture, also more opportunities to create renewable energy uh, from renewable methane. Uh, so it's not necessarily funded from the city or city jobs, but it's really an opportunity as an uh, eco economic development to create more, more jobs outside of government in the private sector to be part of a new economy. But yeah. would they be going, would these private sector jobs be basically relying on city contracts? I don't think, well, I think it, the city contracts are an, an enabler uh, by allowing us to leverage the recommendations that come in from the zero waste plan, if that then creates new opportunities through city contracts or whether that then creates more opportunities for us to process this material that's not necessarily directly from us, but it's an opportunity to expand that the economy more broadly, whether it's through the products that are coming from it or whether it's through the support functions, maintaining additional equipment, et cetera, et cetera. You can also see pretty significant opportunities which we've seen elsewhere. Um, for the private sector, right? If you're if you're disposing of waste either as a resident or as a commercial business, and you realize that what you want to be doing is diverting it elsewhere, there's incentives for them to want to be funding other people who can actually make use of those resources. And you can actually see it across the entire ecosystem of jobs. Um, and one of the things that we know um, from a just pure land use perspective in Boston is that we're always excited about having jobs that are at a wide range of educational levels and given the density of Boston, um, this is a particularly unique opportunity that sort of uses uh, the Boston ecosystem well and all the things that we produce and have on our sort of, on our sites um, for, for jobs that really, right, you can imagine um, this new partnership. There's people with all different kinds of backgrounds that are needed in that process. I wanted to tag onto that as well, Rebecca. Um, you know, we're 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 going to the the goal is to save taxpayer money uh, by reclaiming the value of materials that are that we're paying millions of dollars currently to to destroy. You know, so there is extensive economic opportunity there. Um, you know, we're we're talking about uh, the reuse and repair sector, and then recycling, obviously, uh, potentially and organics, of course. Uh, uh, largest component of, of the waste stream, and, and even manufacturing using recycled materials down the road. Um, this is there's a lot of room for growth, a lot of, uh, and the city can play a key role. Um, as Rebecca mentioned, a really important point is that we're talking about jo you know jobs that don't often require advanced technical skills or, or advanced degrees and so on. 
um, like other sectors do, and uh, and you know these can be targeted in communities that have been that haven't seen the benefits of, of previous economic development opportunities. Um, and and might help me out here, but some of the we were just talking yesterday about you know what role the city could play. Um, uh, you know, and certainly, I mean, we might not be all city employees that the new jobs created, but the city has a, has a very important role to play uh, access to, you know, if you want to just say some of the Yeah, things. definitely. So right now, SETO works indirectly with the city of Boston through the Boston Public Market. Um, that's, we pick up um, probably about one or two tons of compost per week from the Boston Public Market. We're also working uh, closely with the Department of Economic Development on our phase two, which is creating community scale anaerobic digesters that can sit in about uh, one acre to half an acre of land, which is about the size of a parking lot, um, a parking space in a parking lot. Um, and that is, um, would probably be about, create five to 10 jobs per site. And that is a, a community anaerobic digester. So all of the food waste from one community can specifically go to that digester and it will create reusable energy, electricity, methane capture for um, converted um, cars that can run on it. So there's a wide range of ways the city can partner with private um, companies but also think about um, job creation within um, partnerships that may be outside of um, the private sector as well. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to think about in what ways we can um, creatively think of sustainable ways um, to divert waste. And, uh, some of the some of the city, you know, roles that can take. Oh. Um, just two more minutes. Oh, okay. Do you have to go? Okay. Just jump in real quick. Um, during the planning process, I know you involve other municipalities from around the region, particularly when you're talking organics you often need that scale. I was talking to Somerville, for example. They want to do organics, the money didn't line up. Maybe if you team up, there's a way to do it. What, how's this planning process going to talk to, say, your Cambridge or Somerville, maybe try and find some efficiencies there? No, I think that's a really good point because the volume is something that you certainly need to have efficiencies at scale, particularly if you're looking at some of the, the challenges that we face with getting material to some of our existing sites. Um, have capacity, for instance, Deer Island, the anaerobic digesters there are certainly not operating at capacity. In order to get the material there, you need a, a barging program, and in order to make a barging program economical, you need to have enough volume to make it worth it. So we continually work with our neighboring cities uh, through the MAPC, uh, as well as through some of our sustainability focus groups like the Urban Sustainability Directors Network, um, as well as through um, other organizations to ensure that as we're pushing forward on issues like waste planning and otherwise, that if there are opportunities to work together and potentially achieve some of those efficiencies, we certainly want to be exploring those. Gotcha. Last, just one other thing about that. Last year, the city and Zero Waste Boston uh, collaborated to, on, a, on, a, on a process to bring together, uh, you know, cities that had with a zero waste infrastructure, but also um, I think it was nine or ten municipalities are all around Eastern Massachusetts, New, Be New Bedford, all the way up to Lowell, and um, you know, f and we were really thinking about how to use this interest in zero waste uh, across the region to to, to drive, you know, um, a diversion uh, for for everyone. Um, so yeah, in addition to the increased tonnage and so on, uh, and efficiencies that come from that, um, one of the, one of the thought is around uh, extended producer responsibility. There's a lot of um, you know toxicity in the materials that we use currently, and uh, addressing that upstream requires uh, you know size and, and scale, and uh, uh, that's another opportunity there. Um, but you know, just want to say something about what a role that the city could play um, in facilitating. Conversations with lenders, um, startup, you know, startup loans, and, and that kind of thing. Um, this is something that you know small entrepreneurs often don't have access to themselves, and the city could play a role with that. Um, or that, that there are um, sort of plans to have a small business um, resource centers as well. That, right. um, so if, if that's an area of interest, happy to elaborate more. And training, uh, you know, th these are often small startups don't require a lot of capital, but they do require some some skills, and, and uh, so that's that's a role the city can can uh, facilitate, can can help uh, provide as well. 
um, and some sort of stamp of approval for businesses that, that take, you know, do the responsible thing and are looking for uh, zero waste resources, the city could uh, provide a, a, you know, green, I don't know, sticker in the window or something like that, uh, for anything from that to, um, uh, you know, helping uh, businesses looking for zero waste resources to, to find local providers. Um, there's, a, there's a lot, there's, a, there's a, you know, obviously a large role the city would, would play in implementing this, this vision. You talked about, um, it's what, $37 million uh, a year to process all, all of this waste and also reducing the amount of money that uh, the taxpayers are spending on this. If you, the consultant comes up with something that is better in terms of reducing waste, getting to zero waste, but costs more, what's the decision then? I think we have to wait and see what the recommendations are, uh, but certainly we're asking them to do a cost-benefit analysis to ensure that we are doing the most effective, most efficient uh, series of actions to reduce waste in the city of Boston. But if it's if it, the more accurate and efficient reduction of waste costs a little more, is that a, uh, is that a decision that the administration would make to reduce waste? We'd have to see at, at what level, at what scale, and so not going to say one way or the other right now. Got to have the recommendations in hand and, and understand it at that point. And for the community side, it's really important that, that, that we don't just look at the bottom line. There's there's other important factors here that ought to be considered in a, in a larger plan uh, that, you know, we, we can't just uh, quantify all the benefits with, with the dollar saved. Uh, there's, there's lots of... Um, you know, values that are reflected in, in, in uh, community voices and we want to make sure that those are incorporated in whatever, in the final decision the city makes. And social impact, yeah. Great. Thank you. Sorry, I'm going to wrap it up right now. I have to shift over to another event in this room, but um, Dan and Cole, if you have any other questions for anyone in the room, feel free to let Laura and I know um, and we will try to get uh, answers to you as soon as possible. But thank you everyone for coming. Okay.